My name is David Edelson. Welcome to the ENG presentation on Monday, May 15th. Today, we're very glad to have uh, Richard Archibald from the uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and he is the group lead of the data analysis and machine learning group and a mathematician. And uh, let him give us a, a great presentation that we're all looking forward to about federated learning at the Department of Energy. So, Rick. Please take it away. Great. Well, uh, thanks, Dinesh, and I guess uh, David for um, you know hosting me here. I'm I'm really excited to be here. Um, so yes, I am from the Department of Ener Energy, and so um, the way that I kind of crafted this presentation was I kind of came at it from someone who doesn't know the hopefully not too much about the Department of Energy, and I was going to kind of kind of give a landscape of what's going on in the Department of Energy and then kind of uh, focus in on on why we're we're looking at federated learning and, and what's out there. And really, the, if there's a key thing that you want to take away from this meeting right now is that right now the Department of Energy is very much focused on developing labs of the future. They want to create a unified lab system um, where users can come in and have access to all the facilities across the whole Department of Energy and really have access to the uh, information that's there. And historically, the Department of Energy, if you look at high performance computing, has really teamed very heavily um, with um, um, companies, IBM, uh, um, um, NVIDIA, Cray, a lot of different companies, they've teamed really quite heavily to, to just build the high performance um, computing landscape system that they have right now. And really, we're at the infancy of creating what I would call the federated laboratory system. Um, and, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity going forward for everyone. And I think, um, you know, as a nation, we do need to get 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 together and work on this together. So let me start and um, please, you know, just yell out, interrupt me. I won't, I don't really have access to the chat, but if you see a chat question, let me know. I hope, I was hoping that this would be quite interactive. If you want, I can also just um, drone on as well. Got lots of things to talk about, but please, you know, any kind of questions, any kind of anything you have, um, um, shout it out. So right now, this is kind of a landscape of what's going on with the with just the Department of Energy laboratories. Um, so uh, there's the Navy laboratories, the Army laboratories, the Department of Defense laboratories. Um, this is just the Department of Energy laboratories. And and you can see that they're kind of um, spread out across all, all most of most of America. Um, I'm right here, Oak Ridge National Lab. We're just nestled uh, in close to the Smoky Mountains, right outside of Knoxville, in in a city called Oak Ridge. Um, we are what is called open science multi-purpose um, facilities. So we look at all sorts of scientific questions. Um, there's other ones that um, the Department of Energy grew out of the Manhattan Project. Um, developing the nuclear bomb. The Department of Energy is responsible for the nuclear stockpile, and there are laboratories, quite big ones, that are focused in on just nuclear security. Um, environment and energy are the other ones. So National Renew Renewable Energy, Idaho, is um, is focused purely on 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 um, nuclear energy, um, and so we have we have a variety of of different laboratories across the U.S. Um, history, it's important to know your history um, so that you can see, you know, how we actually got here. Like I said, um, the Department of Energy's laboratories that, that exist now came out of the Manhattan Project. When the Manhattan Project um, started, um, uh, they built really um, three big, big laboratories. Um, uh, they built, built a set of laboratories. Um, three to be exact, um, in Oak Ridge area. It was called the Secret City. 
Oak Ridge, um, when Oak Ridge Laboratories, when they started up um, in the 1944, they were taking in 10% of all the power that was generated in the US went to Oak Ridge and it went specifically to refine um, the nuclear fuel for the bomb. Um, they, do, they, they built the bomb and did all the testing out in, out in uh, New Mexico where Lawrence, uh, uh, Los Alamos National Lab now, now exists. And so that's how it came about. Um, but what spurred from that is really kind of um, the story that I want to get at. Um, so what happened after, after, you know, really two years of super intense building and, 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 and science, um, they found out that they, they could actually build, use the nuclear uh, fuel for reactors. And so we, we have the first nuclear reactor in Oak Ridge. And you can actually see these people, they're, they're pushing in carbon rods in, and you can see the lattice right here back of, of carbon rods that they would push in and out to control the nuclear flux of a reaction that's going on right behind them. So crazy times. Um, so what happened really to get us to our point is because of the energy infrastructure that was required to build the nuclear bomb, these this place uh, Oak Ridge was was primed for big user facility experiments, and so here you have the first types of reactors. Um, you have um, particle accelerators that were built on, and later on, these two big things are now kind of our our claim to fame. This is the SNS. We have the largest um, neutron source in the world, and then this this campus right here hosts the the largest. Uh, supercomputers in the world. And those are really our two big things that we're looking at is, is that we have big user facilities. And what I mean user facilities, I mean that they're open to anyone. Anyone, even outside the US, unless you're from North Korea, and I think um, uh, just, just a handful of other countries, you can come in if you need, uh, if you have some great science question that can only be answered by by um, having a beam of neutrons, um, you can come in and apply for time and they'll give you the beam of neutrons. Similarly, with the um, um, supercomputers, if you have something that you can only um, do some great science question that takes a big, large computer, well, you can come in and apply for time and they'll give you free time um, on these computers to do your science. The big question, the big thing is, is that it's free um, for anyone who wants to come in, as long as it's open science and the, and the nation gets to use it, you can actually pay. So GE um, pays for some computer time um, because they want to have um, some uh, private um, company uh, knowledge that they're, gonna, they're going to build um, using this big computer. So they actually will come in and pay for some time. If it's open science, you can, it's free. Um, so uh ai is is a really um big research question in our i think in this last decade and i think it's going to even grow um further and it's a big research question for oak ridge um and so what we're what we're kind of considering is, is is where do we feel that ai really can make an impact um across the across our laboratory at least in other laboratories um so we do a lot of um material design ask ourselves you know um what's the best material that we can di design for xyz um, um problem climate science all the big climate simulations um, um are run at, at at oak ridge that are used in the reports that they that they sent out they send off to the, the nation in the un um the um, smart material additive manufacturing is a big thing um, and then energy, and I just won't go over all of them, but there's just a litany of different scientific problems that, that they, they kind of identify as being useful um, for the um, Oak Ridge National Lab. And, 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 and here again, it's just a picture of the SNS. And just to give you an idea of what happens is, is in order to give you, um, in order to make the neutrons, what they actually do is they accelerate protons down a linear accelerator. It's collected in a ring, and then all of a sudden they start pulsing out these neutrons at 60 hertz that hits a target. 
and the target is a mercury target and it lays off all these neutrons right over here to, to be used for science. Um, so some of the key transitional types of um, R&D that we do here at Oak Ridge to improve machine learning for science is we, we, we study um, physics informed machine learning. Um, we, we look at design of experiments, data reduction, uh, learning. We were very interested in, in um, reinforcement learning, uncertainty quantification, um, and anomaly detection, just a, a list of things that need to happen and need to be studied for uh, machine learning to be really impactful for uh, for for um, the science that's done here. Um, and so we have we have an AI initiative at the laboratory, and what that is is it's it's um, uh, the laboratory you want to kind of think of uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is kind of like a university without students. Um, we have something like 5,000 uh, 5, different PhD student, uh, um, scientists that are, that are across the, um, the physics, um, computer science, mathematics, um, bio, um, e even some of the social sciences are, are represented um, at the laboratory. And AI really can touch a lot of those different areas. And so, um, um, the 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 lab, you know, the lab is kind of set up into divisions and uh, directorates and groups, and they're all kind of mirrored along this kind of um, university type of structure. And the AI in Institute um, spans across the laboratory, so that we can actually um, um, be a part of an institute and still be part, in my case, of a mathematics group and also um, be involved with people that, that do AI across the laboratory. Um, so um, one thing that, again, is what I want, to, I want you to take out of this idea is how we and why we are, 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 are changing the way that we do science at the DOE so that we're, we're more federated, that, that we are, are using all all the kind of scientific tools, all the kind of um, um, scientific, even people um, more collectively. The DOE has a great background in doing massive projects. For example, I guess it came out of the Manhattan Project, and that's where like just teams and teams of diverse scientists got together on one problem to 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 solve it. Um, so the physics lesson that you want to understand here is that um, there's a lot of experimental science that's done at the DOE. Uh, um, and really, what you have available when you're doing experimental science, as far as probes go, is you can, you can use neutrons, x-rays, or electrons to, to study things, um, different materials. Um, they all interact with the material differently. Electrons are normally surface interactions. And so electrons really are used heavily in nanocenters. Um, so every university has a nanocenter. Every laboratory has a nanocenter. Oak Ridge has a nanocenter. And it's just a bunch of different instruments that use electrons to probe different kind of aspects of, 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 the, uh, of, of matter and um, doing experiments on them. Um, and I'll get into that later. But you want to understand that electrons have their limitations. They're normally just looking at, uh, they don't penetrate deeply into a, a material, and um, they normally are, are looking at the shell of an of a atom when you're looking at this thing. X-rays can penetrate more deeply. Um, the benefit of both X-rays and electrons is they are cheap to make, and you can make a lot of them. Uh, neutrons uh, penetrate deeply into the material, and they even interact with the nucleus, and they interact with the magnetic moment of the nucleus. And so these probes um, um, are used across the DOE system for various things, and they all give you kind of what I would say complementary information about your material. And what this is showing you is just neutrons um, being uh, um, 
uh, lighting up a camera and you accumulate how many neutrons came on the other side and x-rays um, being um, show, shown at a camera and seeing how it goes. This is kind of the same camera, um, but, you're, but it interacts with the material differently. And you can kind of imagine that if I have information about both of these things, x-rays and neutrons, I have a more complete picture of what's going on. And, and then this picture just kind of shows you how, where, where, where are neutrons and, and x-rays kind of most sensitive um, with different materials. And of course, if you ever had a microwave, you don't want to um, put metal in a microwave. Uh, neutrons are really good for metal. They're very good also for um, hydrogen. They really interact well with hydrogen. So, so turns out that bio and metal, metal are very good materials to be studying at a neutron source. And maybe you look at other things in another um, area as well. So what here, I kind of talked about the physics um, here. Now I'm going to kind of um, step back and talk about the mathematics a little bit. Um, with all of these different um, experimental facilities, they normally all come down mathematically to answering this inverse modeling question. And the key here is, is that what you measure is often not what you're interested in. You're normally interested in some sort of derived state. So what that represents here is the data that I can actually measure is normally a function of the state that I'm actually interested in and some parameters that I may or may not know. This is the fidelity function. If I knew exactly the state and exactly the parameters, I could use this function to exactly reproduce my data given some sort of noise level. And since this, this problem right here is normally ill-posed, normally you don't have enough data to kind of solve this problem exactly, you're normally putting on some sort of regularization term right here on what you're interested in. What that does is it regularizes when you're doing this inverse problem, the number, the number of solutions that you're actually looking at. You might ask yourself, what's the best um, data that, that's smooth or the best data that has some sort of property that I'm interested in? Um, that, I mean, the best state that has some sort of property that I'm interested in and that fits my data. And so that's, that's what we do as mathematicians here is we, we figure out quicker, faster, better ways of solving inverse problems for, for the data that's generated here. Um, so even to maybe hold, drill down a little bit because I'm very familiar with this problem, um, one way of kind of um, stating what I just said is called the partial just a, a, a very a subset of that inverse problem is called the partial Fourier data problem. Um, here, the data that you're generating right here is um, partial information from the Fourier um, domain. So if I do, t if you go into um, uh, some sort of medical set setting and you get um, a tomography done on you or an MRI done on you or an ultrasound done on you, what they're physically measuring, and there's like a one-to-one -one compare um, correspondent to this, is that they're measuring Fourier data um, in tomography along radial lines. Uh, MRI, you can do some crazy things. You can do these spiral kind of um, measurements and sort of things to get more kind of information or whatever. And ultrasound is this kind of flat sort of, um, um, this represents the depth of your ultrasound right here. But what you are measuring is you're measuring partial Fourier information. If this mask was all white, it means I'd have everything that I need to know to reconstruct the state um, completely. All I'd have to do is take the inverse Fourier transform on my data, and I'd get what I'm interested in automatically. Um, but since there's limitations on what you, how many times you can measure and how many times, how much radiation you can give someone, they normally do low sample, low dose. Um, then you have to ask yourself, well, what's the best image that I can get, the best state that I can get? It's um, compressed sensing came up with this idea that, hey, you just take the, the, the one that has the least amount of uh, wiggles in it or the lowest um, bounded variation, and that's what this means right here. So just to, just to really kind of give you something to hold on to, um, when you go into a CD, uh, a, a CD scan, what you're actually measuring right here is they will shine, if you're in the medical setting, um, x-rays, if you're in our setting, it's neutrons, 
and they shine it through an object and they can calculate how many um, neutrons went through on the other side. So again, I'm measuring something that um, I'm not interested in. I'm measuring how many neutrons got past. What I'm really interested in is what's the form of this um, object right here. That's called the projection data. I can do this for multiple areas. Now, if I take the back projection um, and shine it back this way, all I'm doing is I'm taking this one-dimensional projection data and shining it back onto a two-dimensional image. And I do that for all the things. You can kind of see that you get that, 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 that circle back again. So from this is, this is the principle of, of x-rays. It turns out that, that this projection data, if I take the Fourier transform of it, and I put it back into that mask of my projection data, I have the measured Fourier coefficients that I was talking about from the beginning. So there's normally a transformation that you make on your data in order for you to have the exact um, form of the question that I just posed to you before. But what does that mean as far as doing good mathematics is, is like, for example, if I am doing tomography on this steel um, phantom, aluminum steel phantom, and I only take a few um, back projections. When I do this back projection reconstruction, you can see all these artifacts that that um, occur. If I tried to do some sort of analysis on that, like segmentation, if I just wanted to segment out the aluminum part of this, I get a very bad segmentation. If I use these regularization procedures, I can almost reconstruct the image exactly, and then my analysis works really well. And this is kind of, um, this is an optimization procedure um, where you're using advanced mathematics to kind of get, um, uh, to, you, to, to take a full advantage of the data that you're giving. What you have to do is, is you have to actually go from the radial space that you're sampling, that's where you're getting your projection data, back to the image space. And if you're doing some sort of optimization, what you're asking yourself is, what's the quality of this image? I want to make sure that it fits certain sort of requirements. And then I have to go back and I ask myself, well, how far is this image that I just am asking myself away from my measured data? And then I kind of go back and forth and iterate to convergence as I'm doing this optimization procedure. And so you can develop fast surrogate models that even though the fast Fourier transform is fast, you want to if you want to do this in real time, you have to kind of even develop faster methods. So this is where we use machine learning to kind of do this in one shot and do the optimization in all in one shot. And so here's another kind of example of where that makes a difference. Um, this is an additive manufacturing part. It's made out of, um, I think, two different um, iron composite, um, 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 what is it, um, metal composites. Um, it's thin, so you have to do um, unique tomography. In this case, it's just ro it's rotating along um, an angular direction, um, so you can get the most penetration that you can. These are the actual pro projection data. You can actually see that it's actually taped on to a, a rotating platform. So it, that's that's great. Um, most science is is done with duct tape. If you just do the straightforward um, kind of filter back projection, you get this, and then more advanced methods, can, you can actually get all the defects that happen during manufacturing and even even the tape that 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 was holding this thing together. Um, so, so what what I want to kind of show is is that um, this is this is what I would say has happened in the last five five years is is that you've had this very university kind of structure where mathematicians kind of do math for math's sake and neutron scientists do neutron science and there's not a lot of mixing that goes on and this has been projects where we started to work together um, to use each other's strength to get these things um, done and so and and that's been very successful and we're even going further with this and this is just um here's another example this is neutron scattering you have a material here, you shoot neutrons at it, you figure out um, where all, you have these sensors that, that, that gather all the scattering information, 
based upon the scattering information, it's inverse problem to solve where all the hydrogen is. Again, if you do optimization on this, you're asking yourself, given partial information, what's the best way that I can reconstruct this? At the heart of that, at that problem is the notion of what's the best way that I should regularize my data? How should I limit what I'm searching for um, when I'm doing this optimization procedure? Well, what you normally do is, is if you don't know the right answer, you can actually derive it from machine learning. And this is where we've done a lot of simulations on the forward problem to learn how neutrons scatter um, when you shine it with different material. And we just encapsulated that into a machine learning tool so that it can actually look at this as a pattern and say, hey, when this pattern comes up, I know that this is where the hydrogen is. And so by knowing where the hydrogen is, you can actually do protein folding um, much more accurately and you can um, be given um, XYZ mo molecule and figure out exactly what the structure is based upon this imaging technique. So I'm going to talk about um, federated learning and, and we're evolving in this and this is actually something that happened I would say three years ago. Um, this is the idea of okay we have people, we have um, a big laboratory um, um, and system. We have a lot of people doing a lot of different things. How do we start merging these people together and start making um, what the different pieces that happen um, greater um, than the sum of their parts? And, and so this is the idea of, of having different information. In this case, I have electrons shining on a material. I have x-rays shining on the same material. These are, this happened at Oak Ridge, the electron data. Argon, this happened at Argon with the um, advanced light source. Um, we did these um, um, uh, experiments independently and we sent it off to um, the computing facility at Oak Ridge, and this is where we looked at this data, and we started to analyze the data together jointly to figure out exactly what the spacing is of all the atoms. Once you give the spacing to all the atoms, you can give it back to some place like in Berkeley, where they do this material project product uh, project where if you give me the spacings of the atoms, I can tell you what the properties are, and then this is kind of the loop that they would see that would happen is is that. You would do your experiments. You would analyze your experiments on some big system. Um, you might actually send it off somewhere else to do some further analysis, given um, some sort of properties that you gathered from your experiments. You can actually uh, physically model this, and then you'd throw it back into this big database, and the loop would continue. So this is something that we did a while ago, and all these kind of handoff procedures were just done by basically doing the experiment, collecting the data, and then um, you know maybe giving a USB stick or something like that to someone else, right? And and passing these arrows along, and each of them were done in, in concert to show the 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 fact that you by doing this you can actually figure out what you're actually looking at when you're doing the experiment, uh, and that this analysis can take place in a pipeline. But what they're trying to do now is they're trying to automate all these pipelines and make it a big um, one-stop shop where someone could come in and ask for um, this experiment to be done at Oak Ridge and, and, and Argonne. There'd be robots that would do it. Um, this would be piped off um, in a workflow system to be done at, um, at, at, at Oak Ridge or somewhere other, maybe in the cloud, who knows. Um, and, and then there'd also be the idea of what's, what's out there as far as simulation tools that I can use to merge this data. So, so creating what I would say the infrastructure behind this is what we're really kind of focused in on now. Um, just to kind of show you some, um, what happened with this experiment, maybe just so you can see, um, this is, these are, these, these strips are perovskite, um, uh, layers. So each each um, each um, layer is a different perovskite. So you have um, strontium, titanium oxide, 
and I think a lithium cobalt oxide strip. Um, this is, I'm just showing you it in one dimension. I mean, in two dimensions, there's a thickness here. Um, this, this thickness is, 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 of this strip is, is, is twice that of that and twice that of that kind of thing. So I think it's like, oh, wait, it's right here. It's um, 11, 14, and 18 nanometers. Um, so, so the depth is different. And all they're doing is they're doing an electron microscope experiment where they actually just kind of uh, look, shining an electron beam really quickly at this material and figuring out where all the atoms are. You can see that they're kind of dancing around. Um, that's, what, that's what it looks like at one picture. So just to give you an idea of what the challenge is, is that you want to figure out where all these material, where all these atoms lay. And these big atoms are these ones. There's also atoms in between. This is the structure of the perovskite cell. And um, when you actually kind of look at it, this is what, what the analysis do does. It actually kind of targets, in this case, um, the two units of the perovskite cells. You can actually see at a subgrid level that they're starting to actually kind of separate between them. This, this, there's this kind of oxidiz oxidization that's happening um, because of the experiment. So, so what we, the things that we actually do uh, measuring, when we measure something, we actually are physically changing it as well. Um, and so perovskites are used for um, uh, a lot in solar panels and ha understanding their properties is key. Um, but what it, what, what, what it really kind of shows you is, is it shows you that, 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 that our instruments right now we can also we can measure, but we can also control matter. And these are examples of just you know the the standard writing things out and uh, using your electron microscope um, kind of things. And then um, just so that you can see that 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 there's associated math that goes along with this. Is this you're asking yourself um, if I want to create and manipulate matter at the atomic level. What's the type of math that I have to understand and learn for this process? And and so this is um, this 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 is the kind of math that you have to do um, to to understand the process. It's all based upon stochastic um, PDEs, and stochastic PDEs were 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 built and developed during the rocket age to um, basically give uh, feedback on. Uh, given a certain measurement, what's the state that I'm looking at? Again, that inverse type of problem, but now you're writing it as a stochastic PDE. And you're asking yourself, um, given the measurement of where this atom is, this um, silicon atom is on a graphene surface, um, how do I actually first figure out what the forces is that, that are on it? And how do I understand how this graphene is going to move within the graph, how this silicon is going to move within this um, graphene lattice. So this is really the most basic fun, um, uh, kind of um, experiment that you can do on this kind of manipulation of, of, of matter. And, and so all of this stuff, just to go back um, to this picture right here, all this stuff has to be connected. It has to be done in real time, and there needs to be feedback. So the instruments kind of work looking at the matter, and there has to be this real time feedback of how we actually use this thing. And so this is that smart laboratory idea in just in just one instrument. So um, I, I wanted to make this kind of basic. Uh, I, I mean, not basic, but um, hopefully um uh talk talk about each kind of main topic at a at a at a, at a more fun at a more kind of well in this case cartoon level so that um people that don't have um, very big backgrounds in physics or math or um machine learning can kind of ide identify of what what the tools that we have available to us and how we're going to put these all tools together so this is my this is my quick overview of machine learning um you know, uh, there's the idea, and this is a little bit of dated slide, but deep learning, or you could 
you could replace this with chat GPT. Um, deep learning or chat GPT is just a subset of what machine learning does. And machine learning is kind of all the algorithms that are out there that um, improve um, as you give them more data. Um, artificial intelligence is something more. It's, it's not only that you're improving, you're, you're, doing, you're doing things, but you actually have some that it can actually reason, it can, it can optimize, it can, it can control, it can predict um, what's going on. Um, it's more like uh, at, a, at, a, at a level. I, I love this because um, this kind of shows you um, how we look at machine learning. So, so there's been a couple of things that I've been talking about when you're looking at these inverse models is you have a data, you have data and you have a model. And how do you use both of them to figure out what's going on in your world, right? And so um, right here, is is you got the chimp and all he has is a model. He has a very simple model of how life works and that's how he can get along. Uh, this maybe is like a little bit more uh, um, prag um, pragmatic is that if you look at the data, you're just looking at data and that's how you're going to actually live your life is strictly upon the data. Um, uh, here, this is really kind of an argument in statistics because the big branches of statistics are frequent, frequency, and Bayesian. Um, so a frequentist, and I think both of them have um, have their value. Frequentist, what they would say is, I have a model. I have a model that I like. How does it fit to my data? Um, here is you can keep them side by side and say, um, I have model and data. How do I use both of them together? And then, of course, the Bayesian approach to this whole thing is given the data, what's my best model? And and so. Um, there's, you know, there's more to these kind of machine learning questions that we're asking. I mean, machine, so to put it kind of bluntly, um, I would say that machine learning, grew, you know, the foundations of machine learning grew out of statistics and math. Um, if you ask the uh, statistician about machine learning, you go, they would say, um, you know, if you can't do statistics, you can always do machine learning. Um, so they have this, this kind of, um, uh, view on 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 the on the power of machine learning. It's always for me, it comes down to the data and the model and how you use those together, and how do you actually get causation from uh, how you can sh show that. And so here's the um, the ladder of causation and just this thing right here. So really quickly, let me give you a five minute um, whirlwind um, show of like uh, uh, data of machine learning. Um, sorry if you heard that. I have my um, uh, some friends over. My, my son just came with her friend. Um, so k nearest neighbors is the quickest way that you can identify what's going on with machine learning. It's a machine learning algorithm. The great thing about machine learning algorithm um, in this k nearest neighbors is it's all based upon the data. So let's say I have um, three data points. Um, that are triangles, two data points that are squares, um, doing a classification. This is all the data that I have, and I want to create a machine learning method that would predict what's going on anywhere in space. What Kaler, K nearest neighbor says is, if I'm anywhere in space, I just look to see who my nearest neighbor is, and that's what I am. So if I come in with this X1 value and this X2 value right here, my closest neighbor is a triangle. That's who I am. That's the classification. This right here is your machine learning classifier, classifier right here, visually. Best thing about K-nearest neighbors, you don't have to do any kind of training. Um, the data is, it comes pre-trained. Um, more data you get, the more accuracy. Um, the challenge is, is why this doesn't happen all this time is, is that, um, it, it, there's storage problems and, and prediction when you have a lot of large data sources kind of problematic. But this right here is how everything works um, uh, at a very basic level with machine learning. Um, Google originally, I think they did a, a page rank kind of approximation when they were looking at what you're, what you're most likely interested in. It's kind of a key means of operation right here. Um, let me um, scroll through these really quickly. Um, 
support vector machines is, is this is your classifier and you're asking yourself out of the data, which ones are the most important data such that I can separate it with a hyperplane. This, this is more complicated, but it turns out with this big data set, all you need is these two vectors and you can, you can clearly um, do it quite well. It's a kernel-based algorithm, so depending on your kernels, you can get really complicated geometry and separate things quite well. Um, there's the uh, concept of, of uncertainty in machine learning, and this is where the Gaussian process came in. Gaussian process says, I'm going to have a mean prediction and an uncertainty on that. Um, so these green dots are my data. The red is the true um, um, prediction. That's the truth um, of what's happening. If I sampled more and more, they'd be all sampled along that red line. The blue is the Gaussian process mean interpolation of what's going on. And then it comes with uncertainty bars. And so this is based upon if each point acted as a, a, a as a as a random point. So this is this this is another machine learning method. It has uncertainty now in, into it. So these are these are great. Um, this is just a idea of neural networks. Every everyone's seen a neural network. What you're doing when you're do, developing a neural network is you have input and output data. One of the questions is is what's the architecture of my network. And then the other question is, is how do I map these, these weights and these connections so that I get the best input and output data on my map? And depending on how you actually do this, um, can, defines on what kind of network you're looking at. So um, as far as just to give you a little bit more math, that um, what you can do is it turns out that with um, Deep learning networks, there's a one to one correspondence between the deep learning network, um, which is represented mathematically as this, and an ODE. So if I have an ODE that looks like this, and I, and I take the, and I try to numerically solve it, I would solve it like this. Um, an ODE numerically solved um, will look exactly like um, a deep neural network. And by doing this, um, the recognizing this pattern and just adding in some ideas that behind math that says, hey, um, we know a lot about ODEs and PDEs. Let's um, use that when we're training um, and ask ourselves, what's the most stable, consistent ODE that solves my problem? And, and this image network is, is what really has kicked off a lot of machine learning is, is that Stanford um, collected ImageNet, which is just a collection of images that have labels on them that says, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is whatever. You can see all these prominent con um, um, uh, companies that, that have been competing on this. So like in, 19, in 2013, Google came out and said, hey, we have something that, that's 70% accurate. There was a huge jump when they started looking at this from a PD point of view. And right now, um, the current winner is 91%. It is, um, it is um, what you would say, um, the underlying optimization procedure is this trans, uh, 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 transfer neural network kind of, kind of architecture. And it's what the benefits of that uh, on top of a neural network is, is it helps you with training. So a lot of good tools out there for training. This is what kind of the standard is right now, is this generative um, transformer model. Um, this is what really kind of helps out with everything. And you can, if you go on to ChatGPT right now, you can actually go ahead and ask question. I'm going on a road trip. What should I do? And it can give you this kind of answer. So, so really, we're, we're, we're at the golden age. Oh, we really have come a long ways with machine learning. And this is what, what this looks like. And so I have... Just one more thing that I wanted to talk about, getting pulling this back to the smart laboratory um, in the last um, 10, 15 minutes that I have. Um, this idea of, 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 of using machine learning, using in particular federated learning, um, to pull together information from across laboratories um, to, to really um, help out scientists um, 
look at all the kind of things that these experimental facilities have to offer in one location. And so this was this was work that I started that that I started doing with Ryan Coffey at Slack, and then we kind of grew this. Um, and he brought in Dinesh from IBM, and um, uh, and then and then. Uh, Red Hat got in with the with, with Scupper, and and we've and we're and we're kind of getting close to having something something ready to go, which is exciting. So let me kind of explain this um, of of what we're kind of doing. So Intersect is is a group of computer scientists that are working locally at Oak Ridge to con connect to create the connections for the smart laboratory, and this is their kind of um, um, software architecture. They kind of exact asked themselves that I could have different zones. In this case, zone one could be an instrument, zone two could be a computer resource, um, zone three could be something completely different. I want to connect all these different pieces that are going on in the laboratory um, <clears throat> together. Uh, and so um, each zone is, is, a, is a Docker. Um, 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 virtual environment. They're they're building uh, Intersect builds the the adapters um, that communicate between these dockers. Um, they have a message broker um, system and communication lines that they have right here. And so they're just bringing in some fundamental ideas um, on 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 developing the communication backbone for the smart smart laboratory system. And and this project has just is is in its second year, right? And this project, the way to to kind of explain it uh, in laboratory speak, is this project is being funded by by Oak Ridge by local Oak Ridge money. Mm. They are actually in the process of um, going up to Congress and asking for. A much bigger pot of money. So the the kind of numbers that they're talking about is right now, this is supported on the laboratory at at a level of five million dollars a year locally um, to bring in all the computer scientists, all the science, all the um, um, uh, kind of scientists that are instrument scientists with um, people that do algorithms all together, so that we can attack this problem. All together, <clears throat> they're looking to go to Congress and ask for something like two hundred million dollars a year for the next five to ten years to really build this up. And when they do, they're doing that right now. And and I would say in the next, you know, next few years that that might be in place, and that'll be a much bigger thing where it includes just not just not one laboratory, but multiple laboratories. And and participants, industrial participants. So, um, what does the Intersect laboratory um, system look like? Well, the typical laboratory workflow right now is just um, a single scientist kind of looks at an experiment, does the experiment, analyzes the data, and there's this kind of feedback loop. What we want to do is we want to, you know. Put in as much of the future technology as you have. Any place where we can automate it by robots, we want to. Any place that we can have um, computer workflow systems, we want to have that. Um, we want to make sure that we're creating large databases that we that we can actually keep and use for later on. And those databases can be filled with both um, experimental data and computational data. There's a lot of computational work that's done. To, to simulate experiments, and they have great value on that. On that, all this is kind of kind of um, put together with AI for science. All right. So what what we have right here is um, is that we have um, a, Intersect has has put together a couple of different projects. So so this is the autonomy. So 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 this is part of the five million dollars a year. Kind of like demos that they're putting together on top of the software that they're developing. The autonomous chemistry lab. This is where you have robots that actually will go ahead, um, do the reactions, change different aspects of the reactions, and 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 really kind of be able to sweep through a lot of different kind of uh, a big reaction space um, to look at what's going on. Um, right here we have the 
uh, electron microscope. This is the idea that I kind of showed you before. We have an electron microscope looking at the materials, analyzing the materials with simulation, feeding back into the computer, and they they are building the computer work workflow for around that. Um, here's another kind of project where you have um, actually additive manufacturing working to build parts in um, in a beam line at the SNS where you can actually look at how this part is generated, where all the weaknesses are and everything like that, so that you can have a certified part um, built for you um, where it comes, what is it, um, where it comes um, uh, certified out of the uh, out of the additive manufacturing process. So, so right now, additive manufacturing gives you a, a opens up a whole window of different things that you can look at, and and um, and and so you can actually. Uh, the one issue with this is is that um, it looks it has problems with um, uh, with this being kind of messy. And so you want to figure out where all the problems are with additive manufacturing as you go forward. So now let's drill down to actually what we did um, with federated learning and how this is different from what's been going on before. So um, what we did with federated learning is we experiment um, now that I'm now I'm talking about the things that I did with Ryan Coffee and uh, at, at Slack and, and and IBM and 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 Red Hat. Um, it's looking at small angle scattering. The physics behind small angle scattering, the pieces that we need for this to come off there, is first, um, the same physics apply regardless of the source that you're using. So I can look at x-rays, I can look at neutrons, the same physics apply. Those physics um, are, are all those different, that, that physical model um, um, is, is there's a community code that simulates all these different kind of procedures um, that go on. So based upon the source, the material, the actual beam line that you have, that's all encapsulated in this community software. So what I can actually do is I can use this community software to simulate what would happen at different facilities across the DOE space, where each facility might have has different instruments, it has different sources, it looks at different materials, but I can look at this as a whole um, by generating this using this community software. Um, again, this just shows you all the different places that have um, the this kind of experiment that goes on, and so. Um, what we did, going back to, to to why we needed everyone in this in this project, is we needed intersect to communicate between X-rays, neutrons, and electrons. The facilities. We assumed that some of these facilities were producing data that was open, some were producing data that was secure. But we just zone these data just into individual data. And the nice thing about federated learning is I don't have to move my data at all. Um, the data stays where it's at. And on top of that, um, the actual machine learning itself stays where it's at too. Each one of these zones has a different, uh, generates a different machine learning algorithm to, to analyze just the data that it's looking at. So this, the, without this center part, you would just think to yourself, I have um, six different um, data pools I have six different machine learning looking at this. And what the federated instrument does is in one location, um, it passes what the, what, how, how the machine, how, how each network is doing on its data um, and, the, and the directions that it's going. It compiles that information and it doesn't tell, it doesn't give it any kind of information other than um, it gives the, it, it passes back um, optimization places to each each area as where they should search next. So these are all isolated. They, 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 the data is never shared. Um, and on top of that, um, the, the centerpiece doesn't share any kind of um, network information about or data information to any of the other places. All it does is it shares um, 
it, it gives suggestions of where you should optimize next. And by doing this thing directly in concert, all of these machines kind of converge to the same machine and you find out that, that you can actually get much better, in fact, double the accuracy of doing these kind of um, reconstructions on your data than you would get in isolation by just looking at any, any of the individual thing. And this is the kind of concept of how we kind of think federated learning, the laboratory of the future can kind of occur. Um, and so what we hope to do with this is, is we hope to first publish and then a stretch goal will be is that if we actually use the big computers to do this optimization procedure on some real data, we might take it to supercomputing.